Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hi, this is Scott Hambrick. This show is the one that made me want to start the podcast, but we just, we're just now getting around to it. We wanted to start the podcast so we could put out some seminars so people could hear what these discussions are like. But we realized that we didn't want to put a seminar with our members out into the public because that kind of violates some trust, I think. You know, the seminar needs to be a place where people can make mistakes and they can misspeak and maybe risk making a fool of themselves. And if I put out a seminar from our members out into the public space, I think that kind of takes that away from them. So we didn't want to do that. So I invited some of my friends who are my co-workers at OnlineGreatBooks.com, and we recorded one for you guys. This one covers Plato's The Mino. I'm not going to go into it. You can just listen, and then you'll know what The Mino is about. But you should read it. It's very short. It's maybe, I don't know, maybe 40 pages long, something like that. You should read it. It's a delight. And listen to our conversation. Carl Schutt in this acts kind of like our leader. He's our seminar host. He's the first among equals here. You'll hear John Pascarella, uh, my friend, Miles Marco Bennett, Maliki Walsh. I'm in this one. And, of course, like I said, Carl. If you have some time, please help us by going to iTunes and entering five stars and, and typing up a little review. That's a big help to us because that tells people what we're doing in this show and helps draw some attention to it. Lastly, a little housekeeping. We have enrollment open from October, I'm sorry, from August 15th through August 30th or until we fill up our available seats, whichever comes first. So go to OnlineGreatBooks.com, click the little Join Now button, and join. If you enter the promo code MINO, You'll get fifteen or 25% off, which is $15 off each of your first three months. There's a good chance these seats will be full, actually. And if, it is, if, it, if they are full, just join the VIP waiting list. And then you'll go into the, well, not in the front of the line. There are probably some people already in front of you. But you'll go into the line for the new seats when they open up in probably October. So I hope you enjoy the show and enjoy what we're doing. Thanks. John, what do you have to say about this thing? We'll let you go. So I, I think I'll lead with the question Carl told me to keep an eye on and that I'm not so sure about um, is I'm not quite sure at the end how how much Mino's character has changed. I can see some shift, uh, but I'm not sure at the end he still grasps what Socrates is trying to get him to. So I, I think I'll, I'll confine myself there for now because I don't want to get in the weeds on the Greek yet. Um, but that, to me, it's not as clear at the end if Mino truly learned something yet. Yeah, so that was my my concern. If you, My big question would be, is the dialogue really about virtue? Because I don't know that, well... I'll just throw that out there. Is it? It's connected to the question of whether Mino changes at all in the dialogue. But is it? Do we come up with a conclusion about virtue at the end? Almost certainly not. Right. 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 Uh, I think that I don't think anybody's changed in this thing except maybe what is it? Anitus. How do I pronounce that? It's good enough. Anitus. Yep. I don't know. And I don't know that he's changed, but I think he's like. I see what you're doing there, Socrates, and I don't like it. And I'm going to come and get you. Yeah, I think, that, <laughs> I think it's a commentary on the city more than anything. Yeah. Uh, I, like, why is everybody so corrupt? <laughs> no? In 25 words or less? <laughs> that's another one of my big questions. Is Anathus right to be mad at him? No, of course not. No, no one should ever be mad at Socrates. Why do you say that, Scott? Well, um, because I love him. 
Uh, okay. No, I think no, I think his intentions are all. I I, I I always impute a good intention to him, right? Um, I don't think that he. I, I think he only wants good. Yeah, maybe he's clumsy. Maybe he's heavy-handed. Uh, maybe he's difficult. Um, maybe he's embarrassing, but uh, he's not out to hurt anybody. Or uh, well, maybe. Well, uh, let me play devil's advocate. Please. Let me be Anitus's advocate. Here we have our Athenian society, of which any gentleman could teach virtue. Mm -hmm. Any one of us could, because, you know, we're Athenians. And here comes this guy who is questioning the very basis of our society. Right. So it's kind of a, a, a conservative reaction. What is it? thing say uh, it says let him that would move the world first move himself yeah that's very good mine says duncan <laughs> mine says duncan donuts but i could think of a a, a, a is that bowel <laughs> movement maybe i think so if it's a coffee cup <laughs> <laughs> but if all right so if you think if you are really convinced that culture is important okay in other words that Questions of truth are difficult to get to, but culture is how we keep our society cohesive. Couldn't you see that Socrates is a pain in the ass and a problem? Oh, certainly. I mean, that's his job, right? I mean, he's the he's the gadfly and he's the troublemaker and he's the the questioner. Well, is it? Um, if if you go to uh, Mino's complaint that he's a well, stingray in my translation or torpedo fish, torpedo fish. which is it? He's, he's sort of like a, the houseman and the Socratic lawyer in the paper chase, right? He makes you feel like an idiot. You yep. get in a conversation with you. He sets you up through these uh, web of dialectical questions of which he's expert and you're not. And he makes a fool out of you. So if someone asked if Mino changed it, but Mino at the end, one, I'm kind of pissed at him. Antius is sitting listening to this, and he's pissed. Plus, he narrows definitions indiscriminately. Um, when he's talking about fathers and sons, he never bring, allows Antius to the counterargument. Well, it's not just that a father tries to teach a son virtue, but the son has to be willing to learn it. Right there's no sense of willing to learn. It positive, and also there's not a whole lot of distinction between knowledge and action here. Is a, a virtuous person that has virtuous behavior, as opposed to if you say it's wisdom, well I can know what's right. That doesn't necessarily mean I, I choose or do what's right. And I've seen so often people use, and we we'll probably experience occasionally in your own class. When you get too Socratic, people shut up. And they're pissed at you. It's not really a great education tool too much. Because after you've been made a fool of a couple of times, you tend to shut up. So I can see why people get pissed at him. And I think you're right. It's a deed for a higher cause. I agree with the great intentions. I don't mean to disagree with that. Or his insight or brilliance. But he is a major pain in the ass, I think. Yeah. Well, and Plato presents him this way. So this is a this is an interesting question. I love Socrates too, Scott. So don't get mad at me. <laughs> this, this is a so Plato is presenting an idealized Socrates. He admits as much, at least if the letters are true, um, truly his, and that's what he says. It's an idealized Socrates, and he prevent he presents him as a pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, th this is not he's an uh, I think some of us will be more annoyed with them than others. I, you know, I'm, I'm like game on, you know, I'm ready to go. Um, but my mother, for example, when my brothers, <laughs> uh, we would fight, she'd say, stop fighting. We're not fighting. We're arguing. But she didn't get that distinction. Uh, so, I mean, that's another big question. I didn't have that as a big question, but why does Plato, if you think Plato's an author who never speaks to us, why does he present him in this way? Is it supposed to be attractive? Uh, challenging, you know, um, a model for us? 
well, well, how do we how do we portray Rip? <laughs> um, as a pain in the ass. Is yeah, I had this favorite teacher in high school. Is Homer McClure. Homer McClure died last week, in fact. I'm sorry about that. And, uh, th- well, uh, sorry to Homer. <laughs> I'll be okay. But uh, he, was, he was a great guy. He was the wrestling coach and the physics teacher. And he was a lot like Mark Ripito. Like, the world was an explicable place, and it behaved by laws. And he, you know, he was a lot like Rip. And, man, yeah. he was hard on people. God, I mean, he was really kind because he cared and he wanted us to know what we were supposed to know. But man, he was hard on people. Aren't right, all right. good teachers like that? Aren't all good right. teachers just like verging on abusing your gray matter? <laughs> I was just telling my daughter today about the, the teacher that got me finally be able to read poetry. The first, uh, this is John Waddell. I think he's probably passed on. I haven't looked him up in a while. John Waddell at Marion Catholic in Chicago Heights. So if anyone knows him. Uh, that here's this um, and had me explicate a poem and I get it back and I think it was a C minus right it's like no no <laughs> Carl does, does not get a C minus right so then I I, uh, I got my game better and I explicated the hell out of the next poem I got an A plus and a light bulb went off in fact you can do this in fact there are things hidden in these things you can do it. So perhaps presenting Socrates as an annoying pain in the ass, a gadfly, as somebody that's not 100% likable is on purpose. Well, I mean, clearly it is. He could use any words that he wanted to to portray that guy. I mean, clearly that's the portrayal that he... Yeah, it's not like Xenophon. Uh, I'm going to shut up and let... The I, other guys. I have to tell one more Homer McClure story. So McClure, we show up the first day of school and it's physics, high school physics. And uh, you didn't have to take physics to graduate from Catoosa High School. Can you imagine? Uh, so we all, we all elected to be there. And he passed around this grid and it was the seating chart. And you wrote your name on the seating chart where you sat. And then he, when it was over, he, everybody passed it to the front of the room. And he flipped it upside down. He said, all right, all you guys in the front go to the back. All you in the back come to the front. And he said, I'm going to go ahead and write in your letter grades right now. He's like, if you sit in the front row, you're going to get an A because that's who you are. The guys in the middle of the second row might get A's. The ones on the outside on the second row get B's. And he wrote everybody's letter names in, and he said, I'm going to put this in my desk, and we'll open it at the end of the term. <laughs> so, so back to, you know, the, the father can teach the son, but only if he wants to be taught. Like uh, Homer expected a certain outcome out of these people. And he really tried to get, you know, these people that sat in the back row to do better. Um, but he didn't really think that he could teach. He thought that they could only learn. You see what I mean? The distinction there, they could not be taught. They could only learn. Yeah. Right? He, yeah. You know, he, yeah he, he, you know, and he said that he's like, ah, You've got a book, and that presents the material. I'm going to present it to you in a different way by standing up here in front of you and doing jumping jacks and writing stuff on the board, and you can only learn. I can't melt these ideas and pour them in your ear, he said. Well, isn't that the big virtue of this dialogue? The recollection theory is demonstrated through the slave boy. I mean, that that's what that's really getting into substantive stuff to me is how do people look? Can anybody teach you anything? Or do you have to learn it? And then how do you get prodded to learn whether it's a torpedo fish or not? But that you can't really pour learning into people or uh, indoctrinate them, but you can, through conversation, get them there. But I do have a question which I'd like help for, because as I, I read it this time, John, I was a bit like you, first time in a lot of years, and I'm wondering, well, how much did the visual cues help? Was this all through conversation? Because I'm thinking, you know, kind of like when you go through your Euclid and you, if you actually get the, uh, the ruler and the compass out and do the constructions, it's way easier to see. The experiment sort of requires more than just conversation. Or I'm wondering, does it? Anybody else feel that way? Did he? Was it all just talk? I did think about that. Um, 
because he and he kept doing this to Mino. He kept asking him, "See, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show him anything. I didn't tell him what it is. Right? Yeah. He did this all on his own. Right? Make, make sure that I'm not telling him what the answer is. But you're right. If you draw it, it does make it easier for Mino to see. Now, Mino's ability not not Mino, the slave boy. Um, yeah. He can make sense of it. He has the capacity to think and make sense of it. Right. Um, so one, I think you're right. Socrates might be having a little bit of fun. That might be a, a bit of a loophole that he's found. But the the second thing, that the broader question that it sits on is, okay, so you can teach the slave boy geometry. He can recollect geometry, but does it work the same way with virtue? Right? How exactly would I demonstrate that with figures? And how would I do that in such a way that the slave boy feels yeah. like he's recollecting what virtue is and it's not just being told okay if you do this you're just if you don't do this right you're unjust um, right and that's right. the that's the bigger question i got so, an answer <laughs> oh, somebody else go ahead. oh no go ahead i, I was ahead, just no. gonna say I, i'm back to role models again it's sort of like little kids when they see good by, good guy and bad guy movies they sort of have this instinct to you know, like the good guy and not like the bad guy. To what extent has that to do with the way the story is constructed? Probably quite a bit. But nonetheless, that sort of recognition through role models of modeling virtue and the habits of virtue. And so I think maybe the same thing does come into play, though. Socrates doesn't seem to admit that, certainly with the parents being role Role models. Poor Thucydides kids were what, the wrestlers? Right? Apparently, yeah. wrestlers can't amount to anything, according. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know that's not true. Plato wrestled. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. And and so, so, that's, so that's a. I want to go back to what John said about yeah. whether virtue is like geometry. Uh, Wait a minute. So, that's not what he said. It's kind of what he's <laughs> no. All right, let me rephrase. What is there a way in which virtue could be demonstrated with diagrams? Does it mod, does so does the work with the slave boy map into other things? And I so this one always jumps out at me. Uh, this is at seventy three a. If you have the text here, but Mina says, um, I think Socrates that somehow this is no longer like those other cases. We get this all the time that that uh, especially any kind of talk about ethics, mm -hmm. morality, those two words mean the same thing. Uh, no, we we can't know anything about that. I'm going to let you slip. I'm going to let you slip that in. By the way, which one did I slip in? My, m ethics and morality being in the same. Yeah, thing. I'm sliding that in. Uh, that's, 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 in. in my belief, Miles is laughing at me. Morality, mm -hmm. the Latin translation of ethics. And ethics is the Greek translation of morality. So, I don't know. Uh, I, let's not get caught on that. <laughs> but so Mina says, I think it's different. And so I want to know, is it? Is it? Um, the example of the slave boy, what's the point of that example? Because if you look at the character of Mina, he's gotten more and more confused. And he says, Socrates, you're like a torpedo fish. You have stung me. I have, uh, I'm all numb. We can never know anything. And he gives that paradox. How can we know something that we don't already know? Because how would you recognize it? Mm -hmm. Right? So he's stuck. Well, that's the road to complete skepticism. So if you think, what's the point of the geometry problem? What does it have to do? Does it have to get us to virtue, or does it have to break skepticism? Hmm. Right. The first. How many times? Which one? The first. To get us to, to virtue? No, to break skepticism. To break skepticism. Yeah, so how many cases of somebody learning something do you need to prove that it's possible to learn something? Just one. But then the question is, again, I mean, it goes back to the question that you rephrased. If I can figure out geometry, can I figure out virtue? And I'll just go to what Maliki said about you can look at role models to see virtue. But uh, the two people who Socrates picks, right, the fathers raising their children, 
Themistocles and Aristides, right? Very famous men. Aristides, famously known as the just. Uh, if you point at them, I'll take Themistocles. Themistocles ended up betraying Athens, right? So he looks like a virtuous man. He looks like a great man, but you can't actually point to him and say that's a virtuous man. It's much more difficult to find not only the theoretical knowledge of what virtue is, but if you point at somebody and say that person's good, how can you really know? And caveat, Carl, I'm not trying to induce nihilism. Right? <laughs> But don't sons, I think this comes up in the Republic as well, the whole father-son thing, which is one of his justifications in the Republic for kind of abolishing the family, is because sons rebel against their fathers. Particularly if, you you know, it's a classic minister-son kind of story, right? Uh, the, the, the kids of very virtuous people often tend to go the other way. So... And find different role models. And then the role models they follow may be the troublemakers and the rebels or the other side. Anything that will topple my father is good. Mm -hmm. you, know, you see a little of that in Telemachus. Well, they say he's my father. You know. How would I know? He's been gone. So, um, well, let's think about that. So, again, why Anethys could be legitimately pissed off. All right, so what are our possibilities so Mino gets his question wrong he, he starts with the question of whether virtue can be taught right and Socrates says I don't know I don't know what it is what's virtue and we have um, what are these are two or three possibilities right it is either something that can be it's a kind of knowledge um, or it is some kind of nature, or it's a gift from the gods. Have I missed any? Well, does behavior fit under there? Is the virtues of behavior, ultimately, yeah, well, and not a, not ultimately a knowledge. Knowledge is involved with it, but the yeah, demonstration so, of virtue is a behavior. Yeah. So your talk about choice, knowledge, and action is going to, I think, is going to be real important. Um, because I, I don't think virtue is merely knowledge because everybody knows people who know, like, you know, go outside in the winter in Illinois, at least nobody's allowed to smoke anywhere near anyone else. So in the winter, the smokers, they go huddle out on the, the tundra together. And if you went up to these smokers and said, you know what, smoking's bad for you. What would they say to you? Thanks. I I didn't know that. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, cigarette smoking, Scott. Not an occasional pipe. Occasional but pipe. I have a constant pipe. Uh, yeah, but you know. Yeah. So okay, that's that's another that's another thing. You know, where he talks about people only people never do things that that they know are bad for them. Right. That's in here as well. And we'll have to yeah. put a we'll have to put a placeholder there and come back to that. Yeah. Yeah, so if it's knowledge, we could teach it, okay? If it's nature, we could breed for it, or at least we could recognize it. There'd be a blood test, mm -hmm. you know, like future crime. Like, uh, what's that, the Philip Dick uh, Minority book. Report. Minority Report, we'd be able to do that, except we wouldn't need, we wouldn't need there's, it. There's a bit of that in there that uh, also presages the Republic, because you said, well, what if we found somebody that was naturally good We'd immediately move them to uh, what do you call it, the citadel, and keep them away from everybody else. Remember that little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which All right. So, guardians, I think. Mm. So we've got a couple of hypotheses here, and if it's a gift from the gods, you, you know we're screwed. <laughs> um, but if you have fathers who would be interested in teaching their sons and yet do not teach their sons. Well, that's a problem. Or if you have fathers who are good men, everybody thinks they are, and who have lousy sons, that's against the nature thing, right? So let's do two possibilities here. Either it's not, maybe three possibilities. It's not knowledge, can't be taught. It's not nature, can't be bred. Or, and I think this is what Anethys picks up on, 
none of these men were virtuous. Mm -hmm. It's a deep insult. Yeah, I think why. It, yeah, I, I think it's a deep deep insult in an honor culture. Um, uh, and or and or, um, the 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 whole the whole of democracy swings on this question. Right, hmm. almost to the point you don't even want to look at it. Like, because if if, um, if these things can't be taught, or you know, they're well, period. If these things can't be taught, democracy's out. You, you can't if you can't pe teach people virtue. If you can't somehow cultivate it, then you can, then you can't let people vote. It's unconscionable it's to let people vote unless it's nature and you select for it, and then you have a society of only virtuous people. Right. Yeah. The myth of the metals in the Republic, you just gather them all up and plant them. Limit uh, the franchise to those that pass the virtue blood test. Yeah. Or yeah. well, not yeah. even limit the franchise. Only have a demos consisting of those who are virtuous by selecting for them. Wait a minute. What's virtue? How do we know? <laughs> we don't know what it is yet, but if we could Crap. test for it. Crap. <laughs> Circle. We're going to We're going to test for that, which we do not... Yeah. <laughs> I love Plato. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I think Anatus is right to be insulted. Well, no. That he's insulted means he's gotten the point. I get it. He is perhaps incorrect to be upset about it. Does anybody else see it that way? Does anybody else think that uh, Socrates is poking Anatus in the eye on this? Just me? I, I, you know, okay. it's not just you. I mean, I get it that way too, to some degree. John? Well, Antis turns out to be one of the accusers in the apology. But so, his butt hurt. Yeah, that's a, you really want to use that term for ancient Greek thought? Uh, <laughs> everybody. Everybody's butt hurt. It's, it's, it's just, uh, it's gonna, yeah. it's gonna bug everyone. <laughs> bug. Very nice. <laughs> but, but Anatus, I, I think he is. I mean, he is um, prodding Anatus a little bit because is it Miletus, Anatus, and Lycon are going to be the three accusers in the apology, and by explicitly going after two prominent Athenian politicians and insinuating that a lot of these you know young men who are noble or beautiful, depending on the translation, and come from great lineages, don't know a thing about virtue. But that's what they claim to have and give off the air of having that uh, you can't help but come away with the impression that Socrates knows what he's doing uh, when he's prodding Anatus on this. But he yeah. pretends not to, right? So, right. That's his <laughs> shtick, man. So does his flirting with Mino in, in those points, is Anatus overhearing this and does that make a difference? Because he, you know, he flirts with with Mito at least two or yeah. three times throughout this. Oh, you're so pretty, and you're yada yada yada. Yeah, so, yeah, that does happen. Um, <laughs> yeah, eighty. Take a look at eighty C. I thought that was actually kind of funny. Um, yeah. As far as we know, at least the Socrates that Plato presents to us, he, he all he ever does is flirt. Right. Mm, Carmody. Mm. He never he never actually like Alcibiades is mad at him. I, I got him drunk and we slept next to each other and he didn't touch me. You know, that's that's Alcibiades complaint. Um the reverse me too movement. Right. <laughs> right. Uh but at ADC so so Mino says, You're like a torpedo fish and Socrates in his play Oh, so you've complimented me. You're doing this because you want me to compliment you. But he says, uh, but I will draw no image of you in tur turn. You know, I know that all handsome men rejoice in images of themselves is to their advantage, for they think the images of beautiful people are also beautiful. But I will draw no image of you in turn. Why doesn't he draw an image of Mino? Why didn't he play? If we, he is flirting, why doesn't he play the game? You're so handsome, Socrates. Thank you. So are you. No, that, he doesn't do it. He stops. Well, his game is just to uh, uh, mind F everybody. He's not interested in that other stuff. 
apparently not. Or, well, so John was pointing out all of the uses of the word for beautiful in this. Um, John's such a nerd. He is a nerd. Uh, <laughs> I'm ashamed to say how long it took me to read this dialogue because I realized I couldn't trust my translation. So then I'm just looking at the Greek all the time. Right. So the word um, kalos, am I saying that right? Kalos. Mm -hmm. uh, means beautiful, but it means good. It means noble. It means all kinds of things. So Mino may be, as we would say, physically beautiful, I guess, and yet not because he doesn't know what virtue is or because he's not asking questions the right way or whatever he's doing wrong. He's not actually beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so Socrates can't make an image of him. Yeah. And just to follow up on your point, Carl, I think the next sentence, too, also explains why Socrates will not give uh, Mino the image. It says, and my translation is a little different, uh, this I know of all you noble or beautiful types, you delight in being compared because you make a profit on it. Um, right. There's a, there's a gain mm -hmm. to be had from the comparison. Uh, and that gain is he gets ah. the reputation for being good. So if he makes the comparison for Mino, he, it's just going to be Socrates will turn out being another flatterer uh, to Mino. And that's what Socrates realized. That's the last mm -hmm. thing he needs. Because if everybody's telling Mino he's noble because he just has this echo chamber, there's no way he's ever going to get closer to what virtue is. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I like, I'm writing down echo chamber. Nice use of a Greek so, word. Uh, <laughs> hot chicks. How much? So, do you remember the hot chick in your geometry class? Or, yeah. Or, she yeah. had great figures. Yes. Oh, yes. Now, did she have Not to learn? Terrible. Did she have to learn geometry the same way Hambrick did? Nope. No. Coach Morrison, who's dead now, <laughs> gave her a B plus or an A minus uh, on a little, on a little shoddier work than Hambrick got. There's a, she was, there's like a, she was um, yeah, absolutely. And, and th there's almost a infantilization that happens to really beautiful people. We, we don't expect as much from them somehow in some ways. Like I'm really hot. I feel stuff. like you're talking about me. I, I am Carl. Like how much heavy stuff do hot chicks have to pick up? Right. Oh, well, let me get that for you. How many doors do they open for themselves? You know, like, you know, it's, so it's Socrates just like be like, you know, I'm not going to let you be the hot chick here. You can't, you can't do that. I love that. That would be a great translation. <laughs> so, <laughs> all, all, all beautiful people like to have images, but I'm not going to let you be the hot chick. Not going to let you do you it. get advantage from it. Yeah, because he gets advantage from it. So the echo chamber thing. I, I hear what you're saying, though, about the, the translation of the word. I mean, if it is noble or, you know, or whatever, yeah. then. But, but I, think it, I think my little story still stands. Like, if we just label this guy as noble or, you know, whatever other translation of this Greek word could have, we just can't let him have that label. He's got to prove right. it right now. He has to prove it right now. Right. Well... But I don't think that if he doesn't know what virtuous is, that doesn't in fact mean that he can't be virtuous, right? Sure. You don't have to know what handsomeness is to be handsome. So he may know not not in what way he is virtuous because he can't define virtue, but that does not in fact make him unvirtuous. Oh, that's interesting. So do you think that someone can act with, com I'll make this extreme, can act with complete virtue and not know what virtue is. Well, okay. Is virtue binary? But as in, are you... No, wait a minute. I'm asking the goddamn questions here. Wait a no. minute. <laughs> <laughs> because unless it's binary, then that doesn't matter. Because if virtue is binary, um, and you can either be virtuous or non-virtuous, and it's a complete one way or another, um, then... No, I don't think it has to be binary. Like you could be a sliding scale. Let's just say he's on the the on the on the good side of the sliding scale more often than not. You know, can a guy do that without knowing what virtue is? Can you be doesn't the, that get to the end of the dialogue and right yeah. opinion versus knowledge? Right. Yeah. So I think people just instinctually know the right thing to do. 
Right, right. I think that's um, that's the the statues of Daedalus. Yeah. So if you're virtuous and you don't know why it's virtuous, you're susceptible to mm. um, temptation. I guess uh, you know, come along with us to do this fun thing. <laughs> Throw these. No, pairs. I can't. I'm virtuous. You know. Um, but if you know the reason behind it, then at least the theory is, I'm not sure how well this works in practice, the theory is that the knowledge allows you to resist the things that take you away from the truth. And that's why we have to read these books, right? We well, get like, why, why do smokers, knowing that smoking is bad for them, smoke anyway? Because nicotine well, because is I don't, smarter. Yeah, because this theory of action is not quite correct. It gets right. developed. Even in Plato, it gets developed in the Republic. Like that guy, um, I forget his name, the guy in the Republic that has the sexual attraction to um, pale white flesh and he sees the corpses hanging up on the side of the road. And he doesn't want to look because he knows it's freaky weird, but he can't help because there's these pale bodies on the side of the road. He's like, damn your eyes! And he looks anyway and he curses himself. So... You know, I had, never, I had never read it that way. I, I was reading, when I read that, that's interesting because I'm probably wrong here. But when I read that, I was like, oh, it's just like a train wreck you can't look away from. I didn't catch the attraction piece in there that you did. It, it is like a train wreck, except it's a sexual train wreck. <laughs> I, hey, that's the girl that got the A in geometry. <laughs> so anyway... It, yeah, it, it gets to be, there, there's passions. This dialogue, to the extent it has a theory of action, it's leaving out the passions, in my opinion. You know, it, it's just not taking into account. If you know the truth, you would do the truth. You would do the true thing. Well, he says it would do the good thing, right? Yeah, For sorry. The- true, good, <laughs> conflating them. Well, maybe virtue is like an exceptional case that whereas... You know that nicotine's bad for you, but you uh, you know that smoking's bad for you, but you smoke anyway because you are not virtuous. But maybe knowing virtue is tied into being virtuous. So if you know virtue, you therefore have to be virtuous. Yeah, well, I'm just yeah. I, well, I don't know. I don't want to. Aristotle talks about this, but I don't want to stray from the oh, meaning. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Well, that's the, it's the difference between licentiousness and lack of self-restraint in the Nicomachean ethics, right? Licentiousness is where you choose the bad thing because you think it's good, right? Aristotle actually puts it, the, you get the principle wrong, whereas lack of self-restraint would explain something like smoking. You know so, smoking is bad, you know it's unhealthy, but your passions and your body have been conditioned such that you act contrary to the principle of health. Right. In that case, though, Aristotle says the principle's not destroyed. It's just overwhelmed. Licentiousness destroys the principle. And so that's the way he kind of starts to disentangle the two. You can know what virtue is and not do it, or you could just be completely far gone and have no idea what virtue is. So we bring that back to the Mino, right? So could yeah, these men... Act- John? Okay, Scott. I'm sorry. <laughs> John, you, so uh, you're talking about uh, in in the ethics where he talks about the continent and the incontinent, right? Yeah. So are those? Uh, do you not translate and get continent and incontinent when you when you work with that? Uh, I don't. Um, in fact, the word for it, like uh, encratia, so strength is actually part of it, right? Okay. So you could use kind of restraint to to get at it. Um, but Probably. yeah, th- that's the term. It just depends on the translation that you use. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Incontinence always got giggles. Right. You know, high school kids. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. Now, so if we bring it back to the Mino, <laughs> uh, would it help us out of this dilemma uh, that Anitus is pissed off and might be right to be so? So it's either knowledge or nature. Well, maybe it's knowledge plus nature. Or knowledge plus conditioned nature. In other words, knowledge plus habit plus nature. Okay? So if that's the case, the fact that Themistocles, a shady character, Themistocles has bad children doesn't mean that he's necessarily bad. It means that there could be a failure in any one of these three things. 
Mm-hmm. In the transmission of knowledge and conditioning and nature, anyone could go wrong. And nature's the bottleneck because without them being naturally capable of virtue, they can't be virtuous at all, right? Right. Whereas, right. whereas if they were naturally virtuous, but then he failed to transmit that virtue, then it's a failure on his part. Right. And you could you could have one or the other. So you could have knowledge of virtue and just have lousy habits. Um, you know, I could raise my hand here. You, you could know all sorts of things and then just be lousy at it. Mm-hmm. Or you could have really good character, just kind of maybe by accident and not really know, but you just, na- I would never do that. Right, like a yeah. uh, Forrest Gump. Yeah, I, I would never do that. That's... And and so I have this argument. Uh, this is another issue. I uh, the connection. Boy, this is going far from the mean. But the connection. No, it isn't. The connection of virtue to the gods. The connection of ethics to the numinous realm. And well, he's bringing think, up uh, divine inspiration already at the end, right? That right, that, right. That the virtuous but, people are divinely inspired. And don't you also, isn't there a foreshadowing of one of your alternatives wasn't that the lack of virtue comes from the fall? Human nature is inherently flawed. Therefore, it requires a divine intervention for virtue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, this, so that, In a way, it's just a precursor of original sin kind of in a seed form at the end of this dialogue. Could be. Could be. And what I've found... Uh, that's I'm jotting that down. Darn it! All these notes. Original sin in the Mino. There's an article right there. Yep. That's original sin and Mino. Uh, and for me, but so I, you know, I get in arguments. I have some people that are, um, you know, whether there's a connection between religion and ethics, and the ones that say most assuredly not, tend to be people of pretty good character. Right, And in my unscientific survey, the people that say, no, there absolutely is, tend to be naturally of not such good character. In other words, they, they see an abyss yawning and they need something to cross the abyss, whereas the guys that are just <laughs> generally good, there's no problem. God, no God, it doesn't matter. I'm going to do the right thing. Right. So they require the fear of punishment to maybe the fear or or just the rational basis of it all it's not always fear of punishment it's just that the gods have ordered it this way they they don't they don't recollect they don't automatically recollect virtue like the slave recollects the proof right right by the way notice that carl is in a gym and there's a squat rack behind miles so crazy yeah. well i've got a, a bowl of nuts in a manhattan next to me so. <laughs> you win <laughs> you win and i haven't had a manhattan in a while i need to have one mm. <sighs> darn it maliki um so uh, well okay so let's 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 go to some of these big questions is it possible to learn anything what happens with with the boy if the dialogue's not about virtue or maybe it is but the center is about geometry. Can you actually learn anything? And if you can, how does it happen? Well, in some cases, it's you're given a rough outline of what X is, and then you reason out from that. So, like the earlier you said, like if your father was to tell you this is a virtuous act, this is not a virtuous act, and that's like a rough outline. It doesn't give you a reason for why this is a virtuous and non-virtuous act, but it does tell you that this is a virtuous and non-virtuous act. And then from that, you can then reason that what connects these things. So, yes, the reason's a big word there, Miles. (laughs) Uh, What are we doing when we're reasoning? We're selecting the things that are connected and so, so you're encircling the definition, right? You have these, you have these uh, points on a graph, and you know that they are all representative of one thing, either falling within the Venn diagram or outside of it. So in the case of virtue, uh, it's virtuous to, I don't know, uh, 
as he says, um, it's virtuous for a wife to look after the household. So that falls within that. It's virtuous for the king to look after his subjects. So that falls within virtue. It's not virtuous to do this. And that falls without outside the Venn diagram. And so then you have right. to, to draw the separating line between them. And then you have a definition. All right. I like that picture. Uh, how do we know where to draw the line? Of miles. Isn't there a, a distinction here that we haven't brought up, which is a, uh, the distinction in math of the sort of describing the way things are connected, right? Versus values and what's important, right? It's one it's thing great. to do an abstract of circles and shapes. It's another thing to figure out if you're the engineer, which circles and shapes and weights and physics will hold the bridge up because then you're selecting not only on the, by the virtue of logic, but also by the virtue of what's important or values like safety. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, that these a virtue brings in a whole other category of knowledge, which is not just knowledge of the world and the way it works, but also an understanding or debate about what's important in life or in preserving Athens or yeah. what's important in leading a good life. Yeah, so Mino says, I think this isn't quite like the other cases. And he's right, I think. Yes, I think he's right, too. Um, but, okay, so what then is the importance of the geometry? It is not that value theory is geometrical. I don't know if anyone thinks that anymore, except maybe Peter Singer. Um, <laughs> but uh, name dropping. <laughs> yeah. I taught his book. It's an interesting book, the uh, Practical Ethics. Yeah. Uh, I think it's actually a good book that I completely disagree with. There's a lot of those. Well, but, you know, so in advertising, we use the term permission to believe. And in advertising, logic is permission to believe. Hmm. Uh, but persuasion, it relies on desire. And values, okay. like, what do you want? And then you're almost willing to believe anything that will get you there. You mean, I could sell a diet pill in a minute, you know? Hmm. Yeah, so I, I, okay, permission to believe. So what the logic does, what the, let's call the geometry maybe the logic here. It's permission to do what? To see this boy recognize the right answer to a, a Interesting question that the square root of two is, is you know, the factor that you multiply, you know, how to double a square. What's it giving him permission to do or giving me no permission to do once he sees it happen? Yeah, I guess yeah. giving him permission to believe in the recollection theory of knowledge, right? Yeah. I think there's that, but I also think it's significant that he picked a slave boy because if it's supposed to bear on the question of virtue, right, the wealthy, the magnificent would think only they are capable of virtue. But if you show a slave boy learning who by convention is not seen as an equal, that he can learn geometry as well as these noble uh, young men, then perhaps you realize, well, virtue doesn't necessarily belong to those who call themselves noble and good, uh, which anytime you see gentlemen in the Greek, gentlemen in the Greek is literally noble and good together. Right? So I think that's, that's the other part. It shows learning is recollection, but also to show the, virtu the so-called virtuous noble and good don't have a monopoly on learning and virtue. I hadn't thought of it that way. I'm, I'm wondering now, could Mino have done the problem? Hmm. Being suspicious. Maybe he's no good at math. My favorite quote in the whole thing is at the end of that. So after this whole, th this is uh, about page 86 in the Greek, 86C or so. Um, we do this whole geometry problem and show that recollection is true. And, and Mino says, do you, uh, well, Socrates says, you know, I, I do not insist that my argument is right in all other respects. Okay, so he's not going to insist on pre-birth and then 
you know, you're born and you forget and then you recollect. He's not going to insist on that. But I would contend at all costs, both in word and deed, as far as I could, and he does actually, he dies for it, that we will be better men, braver and less idle, if we believe that one must search for the things that one does not know, rather than if we believe it is not possible to find out what we do not know, and that we must not look for it. So the story of recollection has a point. And it's not that it's 100% true. Does that make sense? It's a good story to believe in. Right. I'd bring up Game of Thrones and, and Varys's, you know, stories when he's talking to Littlefinger. This is in the TV show. I've talked to Scott about this before. And Littlefinger is like, chaos is a ladder. And Varys is like, no, we need stories so that people can act well and believe and have a good life. This is that kind of story. You know, you'll be a better person if you believe that you can learn things. Yeah, sometimes yeah. we have to lie to ourselves, right? Well, I don't know if it's a lie, but even if it was, it'd still be better to believe. Right. That seems to me to be the claim. Well, in the, the passage that you pointed at, um, I think you said brave, right? It's at 86B. B and, into C. Yeah. yeah. So brave or courageous. Right. And um, I think I, I wrote down the wrong note, but when Mino names the virtues he wants to know, courage is the first one. And here Socrates is showing courage resides in the inquiry. It's not going into battle. Right. It's not ruling the city. It's inquiry itself is a source of courage. Right. Um, and even this will be good since you've got the Art of Manliness podcast going up. The Greek word for courage, right, Andrea, literally means manliness. Right, so he's also getting Mino to think, well, maybe courage isn't just displays of physical strength or battle or politics. There's something else where you can be courageous. Building yeah. on that, John, because that passage comes right after the, that flirting passage we were talking about, right? Where he said, well, you just compare me to a swordfish. You want me to compare you to not a swordfish, a, 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 a torpedo, torpedo fish. Um, and you want me to compare, and then he goes into the whole shared inquiry thing, as opposed to the, what do you call it, John, when heuristics, uh, debating and fighting over it, so that this is a better way for people to share than flirt with each other, but rather kind of do a productive shared inquiry into important things than just flirt. Yeah, so I like to, uh, um, and I'm blanking on who brought this up, the idea of, I think it was Malachi, the idea of virtue is being modeled. Well, is this right here a modeling of virtue? Socrates yeah. is a pain in the ass, but also is he not modeling virtue, just like my annoying teacher in high school modeled reading poetry, you know, and got me to do it by annoying me? Yeah, uh, I think that's part of it, right? Especially since towards the end, the turn is to more political figures who would seem to be virtuous because they're uh, prominent, because they're famous, that Socrates is showing uh, there is a way outside of these things that you think are most important to be virtuous that you haven't seen. And I want you to try to move to it if you can, although he's not going to come out and say that explicitly. The whole point is that you take it on yourself. So yeah. let's just get into your whole progressive resistance theory of learning <laughs> and the truth of it. In other words, is learning and suffering hand in hand? There's no way to avoid it. Can learning be a pleasure or is the pleasure only from the struggle? Well, because as an advertising man, you know, my job was always to make learning a pleasure. Right. I think that, uh, so there are a couple of things when I think about this, you know, we talked about, you know, this was this intellectual linear progression. Our weightlifting program is called linear progression. And um, I think we're, I think we're actually more in, in, in there, in, in using that idea for these great books. I think it's more about, we're back to Aristotle. It's about habituation, right? We're going to develop a habit of doing this. 
Uh, we're going to approach it in a in a rational way, right? We're going to have a starting point and move towards an ending point. When they throw dirt on us, there's never an end to it. But but we are going to go about it in a rational way, and we're going to develop this habit. And we ask you know for three hours a week to work towards you know moving through this canon. Um, yeah, it's hard. It's miserable. You feel dumb. You know, you have to read the page four times because you didn't get it. Um, and I don't know, you know, and I don't know that the, I don't know that I can be taught from these books either. You know, I can learn from them, but I don't know that I can be taught. Yeah. I don't know that it's, all right, so let's think about it from an advertising standpoint, which I'm not going to do very well. Um, yeah, it's a little uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable like, a roller coaster is uncomfortable, right? You know, you, you start having your your thoughts disemboweled before you. <laughs> You're like, I'm not sure how this is going to go back together. But let me ask the participants: Is this fun? The discussion's fun. This is fun, isn't it? <laughs> not the reading, Miles. No, not the reading. <laughs> uh, I think it's great fun. I I think. Um, I mean, let's go to Aristotle. Uh, Aristotle, and I don't think he disagrees with Plato at all on this, that, that, that there's that funny end part of the Nicomachean Ethics where there's all this political virtue, and then in the end, you, the game changes, and it's contemplation. And that's the highest good, and that's the most fun. It's the best exercise of your intellect. Uh, I think it really is fun. I think... Um, uh, people who listen to this, if you know, if this gets on the podcast, and you're sick of us using weightlifting metaphors, but tough. Yeah, weightlifting's tough, but it's awesome. It, it you get done, and it's great. You're so glad you did it, and we over. I think we oversell how difficult it is. It is, is difficult, but it's very rewarding. The Go progress ahead. is objective, right? You have objectively become stronger. I think. The hard part about the great books is that you don't have a metric to go by. You, I mean, you're progressing down the cabinet, but you can either be absorbing it or not absorbing it, and you right. still be progressing down the cabinet. And you that's become, the hard part. You're not you sure become, whether you are. Yeah. You become more and more annoying mm -hmm. to the ordinary people around you. That's the metric. That's how you measure it. <laughs> people By the number of people who stop talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> in well, what do you mean by that? Would you just shut up, Carl? You know, <laughs> can't you just talk? No, I can't. I can't just talk. Ruined. Uh, there's so much to, to go up on uh, in this thing. Um, I want to bring up something that uh, John and I were chatting about this outside of school. Uh, there are words being used in here of the theater. Mm. So this goes back to the answers that when they're talking about shape and color and Socrates gives these very strange but useful definitions for these things. Like, uh, uh, shape always follows color, which is really weird, but absolutely true. Mm. Wherever you see color, there's a shape. Shape is the limit of a solid kind of weird but absolutely true and gorgias doesn't or i'm sorry mino doesn't like the answers uh and uh so it's i think 76 e he gives a um a different kind of an answer and he tells mino it is a theatrical answer so it pleases you mino wants answers that are theatrical and what's the word for theatrical john it's a tragic A. So a tragic answer. Not yeah. necessarily in the English sense of tragic, but a theatrical answer like you'd see on a stage, which is kind of cool. So what Gorgias and Mino are accustomed to do is to give a really shiny answer that might not necessarily answer anything. Yeah. Like, what is it? The color is the effluvium of shapes? Isn't that the weird answer he gives? I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not any better at identifying, you know, color and shape than 
wherever you find color, there is shape, you know, it's not any better than that. It just has fancy words. You could write a soundtrack for it and, you know, the effluvia of shapes <laughs> to a movie trail. That's our Name first album. The, group, the effluvians. Yes. <laughs> And and let me add to the the theatrical answer because um, so as Carl already said we were talking outside about the way noble or beautiful appears, uh, but the other thing this this goes to the very beginning uh, right at seventy the end of B into C, and again my translation's a little different. It's specifically so he's talking about uh, Gorgias I believe or no Aristippus specifically he gave you your habit of answering any question fearlessly which is always good my translation says in the style of men who know i believe carl said your trans the group translation is grand uh but the yeah, reason why grand answer. Hmm? yeah yeah i was just confirming you're right yeah. okay uh but the word for grand there is the greek word for magnificence and if you jump to i think it is 74a when Mino lists the virtues that he wants, 74A, right? It's, I think courage is a virtue and moderation and wisdom. And my translation has dignity, but again, magnificence appears, right? Magnificence is one of Aristotle's moral virtues, but everything for Mino is about the appearance of looking a certain way. So the theatricality reflects one, someone who knows, but even the word for magnificence, uh, megaloprepea, right? So we know megalomaniacal, uh, right? It's great, huge, right? Bigly, right? The biggest. Uh, He wants to give this appearance uh, and and it comes up over and over. It's all about how he appears. And, you know, it's very clear. Virtue doesn't work that way. You can't see virtue like you can see color. But John, isn't that kind of in, inherent in the culture from the Iliad and Odyssey? You know, uh, when Athena comes down, she's uh, almost flirting with Telemachus, saying how tall he is, how good looking he is. And then when Odysseus would appear on an island, he one would always have to clean himself up and Athena would do some swirl around him. So he was looking good. And also the way you spoke. Well, I know you're not just some roustabout. You're clearly from a noble family based upon the way you speak. So wasn't that kind of an inherent in the culture as a value? Yeah. I think it's inherent in the culture, but it wouldn't just be confined to the Greeks. This is a, this is a human thing. We like to yeah. appear a certain way to others. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it's just interesting how much Plato is playing with sight in this dialogue and the virtue that means a lot to Mino shows you just, he cares about how he looks and Socrates is saying, maybe you're not seeing right. Right. And if he cares about how he looks and it's so easy to confuse him, well, (laughs) we're back to the girl on geometry. Dang it. (laughs) Right. Mino's the hot chick. Uh, But he's, she, he is being shown that, he ain't so hot, you know, that, that uh, if you generally were that which you appeared to be, you wouldn't fear Socrates, would you? Like if you actually, you can see, I don't want to get into modern politics, so I'll keep this very, very vague. But you can watch politicians who get interviewed, they get a question, and you can see them thinking, and their eyes are moving, and they're thinking, what do I have to be to this audience? What answer do I have to give to present the right, you know, um, public persona? Um, and there are other people that, you know, they go to interview it and it's just fantastically fun because they just tell you what they think because they don't care about the appearance, you know? Um, but Mino, I think he would have to, if you gave an interview with Mino, he'd have to say, let me, let me get my notes. <laughs> Uh, how do I appear to best effect to this audience? It would all be like stage acting, stage walking. I don't know. Do they do that in England, Miles? (laughs) Theatrical walk. Just in drag. (laughs) (laughs) I work with the British. They love to dress up. (laughs) 
I'm just pulling your leg, Miles. But I worked at J. Walter Thompson. We had a big, I worked a lot in London. So at all our parties, everybody loved to dress up. Well, as women or just anything? A little bit of both. A, a, a big deal on the women's side, yeah. I've seen John, I've seen John Cleese. <laughs> what, yeah. Ministry of Funny Walks? Yes. yes. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I, you know, you were, so back to, you know, why does Anatus hate Socrates? And I think I could tie this back to this, what you were just saying. You know, I, I, I've thought of, I thought of, you know, what, what if Socrates was running in a, a presidential debate? You know, would they like him? <laughs> he, he just wouldn't let him give an answer. And well, he wouldn't let him give a pat answer. You know, you know, no, no public person wants to be exposed to or by a character like Socrates. But do you, do you think it's fair? I mean... Fair. Well, for, it's, it's not a fair matchup, is it? Socrates has these dialogues, but they're not really dialogues. He, he, he knows where it's leading when he starts, and then he leads them down the road I, of the dialogue. Well, I don't, know if, I, I don't know if he does know where it's leading. Well, he knows the way in which to put pressure on them to get to a place close to the truth, right? Which, to, and if you know, if you know how to get somewhere, you must know where you're going. Uh oh! How do you know something if you don't know what it is? Um. Let me support Miles a bit. For my father used to tell me there were four kinds of men: hunters, fishermen, farmers, and trappers. And I always figured that um, Socrates is a trapper. He puts out his snares, right? And he knows you're going to step into one of them. And if, after, after he gets you in one, he, he takes you down the parade in the river. I want to know more about these four types of men. It'd be a podcast. Well, hunters pursue, right? They're single-minded, very focused, usually end up being CEOs. Um, and they dress well, <laughs> they can, and they have the best equipment. Uh, fishermen are, well, you can take it from there. Think of the habits of fishermen. Mm -hmm. And they tend to be more mystical and read signs and spots on the lake and where the sun is. And farmers. Like like Peter and Andrew and James and John, right? Fishermen. Yep. yep. Mystical. Anyway, it helped me through life. Yeah. As soon as I knew which guy the first of the guy was. Um, that's yeah, it is interesting. Like I have like two sales models in my main business. We got like the hunter and the farmer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you need uh, to become a trapper in uh, online. John says he doesn't <laughs> exist on Instagram. That's horrible. Then you don't exist. Um, I'm okay with that. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that Socrates knows where he's going with these things, except that his point is to show these people that they don't know. I think the only, the only outcome that he's expecting when he gets into these, and you, you know, we'll never know is, uh, is to just wreck them, disabuse them of their ideas. I, I think that's it. All right. So let's, let's take this. Uh, you, you brought up the, what if Socrates moderated a political debate and, uh, I think that'd be fantastic. Wouldn't it? I, I, I've already told you who my, if I'm casting Socrates mm. in my mind, it's Peter Falk. Right. Colombo. One more question. Miles, look it up. If you don't yeah. know who Peter Falk is. Uh, he's also the, the dad on, on uh, Princess Bride. Which is the greatest movie ever. He's you looking it up right now. Are you looking wow. it up? <laughs> right. He only has one eye. <laughs> Well, so candidate A says something like, uh, I think this would be good for American soccer. He says, wait a minute. What's the good? What is the good? Mm -hmm. And then it goes off and you end up after an hour's debate, not, just, not ever getting past the word. Right. And meanwhile, there's policy decisions to be made. What would a Socratic Republic or Socratic democracy be like? How would you run it? You need mutual definitions, right? That's the thing. You don't. You, I, I think this whole getting hung up on defining words is the wrong thing. You need to have a mutual thing that you're discussing as symbolized by that word, and then you can move on from there. 
you have to agree on what X is and then you can work around it. But if you don't know what X is, then you can't well, maybe, then see how to implement X. Maybe we do the method of hypothesis. Let's act as if this is true and then we'll see how it goes. John's holding go, up two fingers. Yeah, I, I think this could go one of two ways. Um, so I'll go the first way that relates immediately to this text, which would be, uh, let me get my Greek pagination right. So this is 73 C to D, where uh, Mino defines virtue as nothing else but the ability to rule mankind if you're after some one thing in common to all cases. And Socrates says, I am indeed, but does a child possess the same virtue, Mino, or a slave the ability to rule his master? Does it seem true to you that one who rules would still be a slave? It surely doesn't, Socrates. No, not likely, my friend. And there's a further point to consider. You say ability to rule. Are we not to add to that justly, not unjustly? Right. And so then that's where you get justice that starts to come in. So one way to look at what a Socratic politics could be would be this, right? A, a true search for what is the underlying idea behind these terms that get bandied about. Um, outside of the text. The second way, though, is I don't know if what Socrates does lends himself to the order of a city. Um, and I'll, I'll just say this briefly, that that whole city in speech in the Republic, does Socrates actually think it's possible? It doesn't seem that he actually does. No, right? so. It's meant to show that if you want to arrange a city perfectly, You'd have to dismiss things about human nature. You'd have to assume that the good are born from the good, the bad are born from the bad, and it's not that way. So the other way to look at it is that it's not that Socrates would push for clarity. It's that there's something about the life Socrates lives that is fundamentally at odds with politics, and it would be a mistake to try to turn politics into that. Okay, so is an Anitas right to be pissed off? and to raise an indictment against him. Is he an Short enemy answer. of the state? Just like Will Smith? Right. Yeah. Uh, Socrates, he questions the virtues of the city. He questions the city's leaders. He questions the city's gods. And he frequently talks with right the children of prominent Athenians. And he doesn't teach them. He doesn't charge them a, for a fee. But he does everything that would put him at odds with the city. He does. So is he, is he, well, that's not quite an answer to the question. <laughs> yeah. I think he, I think that he is an enemy of this, of the state. And so here's the next thing. <clears throat> Are we, enemy might be too strong. So, but, uh, well, I don't know. I mean, so, so do we end up, you know, do we end up on that list? You know, if you get, 10,000 people to read the Mino and go, Hey, Hey, what the hell is virtue? You know, what are these people doing? Uh, you know, are we, do you ultimately end up subverting the, the political order? If you get enough people to do that? No, because the only people who are going to end up questioning it will have already, already questioned it. Oh, I don't know about that. I mean, I've, I've, uh, Particularly justice, you know, he, that's how the, that's how the Republic starts out, right? What's justice or, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about justice out there in the world, in the news and so on. And I don't want to, I don't want to make it too contemporary, like you say, Carl, but, but if you, if somebody starts talking about that and you say, Hey, wait, 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 what's, what's justice? You're talking about Supreme Court nominees. You're talking about this policy, that policy. Wait, 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 wait. So that what can happen? Oftentimes you find out they don't know what they're talking about. They don't really know. They're carrying around a a notion of what justice is that, that has no definition. It's completely amorphous. It's a moving target. It depends on their mood of that, that moment, about their blood sugar. Like it's... <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't mean anything. Um, and so I think that I think you know you can, we can often catch people that are coming down hard on the side of an issue, and then you drill down, and, and they they don't know. 
Uh, so what's but it, isn't it that they're imagining a future? Oh, absolutely. And they have you an can... agenda that comes out that goes with that future, and they advocate for it, and they try and eliminate obstacles to that agenda. So I'm thinking. So this goes beyond the Mino, but one of the what is a takeaway from a one of these Socratic dialogues where you get to the end and you're you're confused, but what have you gained? You gain maybe I maybe we don't know what virtue is. Maybe we we'll be a little more cautious. So one of the dialogues that is an absolute favorite of mine is the Euthyphro, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but everyone pronounces it that way. Euthyphro, where uh, the guy comes in and he's sure that his dad is guilty of murder. Absolutely sure, and he and he's righteous, and he's he's pious, and he's going to convict his father because it's the right thing to do, and. So he and Socrates start talking about the gods. Seems reasonable, right? And uh, we get to the end, and he's confused. And then Euthyphro says, "Look at the time. You know, I got to go." And the question is, well, what what does he go do after that? Does he continue to prosecute his father after being shown that he doesn't really know what what the pious thing to do is? In other words, if this will be betraying some of my own concerns here, but people are so damn sure that they know what the right thing is. And darn it, we got to act. We need to do this now. We need to do something. And for me, a Socratic Republic would be the place where, now wait just a minute. I've got another question here, you know, a Colombo Republic. I've got one more question. In other words, back off. Let's proceed cautiously, perhaps by method of hypothesis. You don't know. You don't know. I mean, this is a, um, you don't know what the effects of a policy change are going to be. So by method of hypothesis, do you mean implement something, see if it works, if it doesn't work, remove it? Right. Yeah. Pragmat <laughs> pragmatism, I guess, but not, not full on idealistic program of like communism, for example. Carl, you would like this quote from Wyatt Earp. Uh, when you're in a gunfight, you better hurry up and slow down. I know that quote. That is an awesome quote. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he didn't want to shoot fast because if you shoot fast, you miss. You have to shoot as fast as you can. So hurry if up. You're counting on the other guy shooting fast. Yeah. You hurry up, but you hit everything you, you aim at. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the Wyatt Earp theory of government. Um, so I, I don't know that it's unproductive. I don't know that he's actually an enemy of the state. I think he's an enemy of a thoughtless state. Yeah. That that, that's why I said I would think enemies too strong. He does put himself at odds with the city and its conventions. Uh, but even in the apology, right, uh, he refers to himself as a gadfly, right? I meant to, to spur you on to something else. That would be the ideal role. And then that question of whether or not you're an enemy of the state really depends on your regime. If you have a regime that allows freedom of thought, right, which in principle our regime does, it's more you can be a Socrates with right, the repercussion of not drinking hemlock. Uh, you mm -hmm. might be banished from Twitter and you might not be allowed to bake cakes, uh, but you could still function, right? The city's not going to put you to death. Um, but I, I think that's, there's something to that, right? There, that mentality, well, we need to do something, right? At the end of Euthyphro, if you had the, we need to do something mentality, Socrates would follow Euthyphro to the court and make sure that he doesn't prosecute his father. But the more philosophic hmm. approach that he advocates is, here are the arguments, right? Here's what you think. Here's what could be the case, right? But ultimately, true persuasion doesn't come from, you know, twisting somebody's arm and saying, do what I say. They have to understand exactly why it is they think what they do. Uh, but that, that's a limit, right? You don't know if Euthyphro is going to do the right thing, but you probably could live with yourself better having pointed the right way rather than torturing Euthyphro into doing what you want him to do. Yeah. Scott, what were you going to say? Can people be persuaded? 
if if they can't be persuaded, then the whole philosophic enterprise is shot. Maybe they can recollect. Right. That's the point, right? So somehow, so the way I, I like to do this thing, we haven't even gotten into it. This shows, uh, if we ever have an audience, this shows, humble audience or, or honored audience, that these things are deep, right? You could make the Mino be entirely about theories of knowledge, and we've hardly we've hardly talked about that, right? So it seems to me, uh, I want to know what's going on when the slave boy learns something. What actually happens, you know? Does he... Is he um, recalling his previous life? Do you really believe that? Are you, do you want to go full board on the reincarnation? I don't know. But something is happening. He goes from the moment of not knowing, and then he says, aha. And in the comics, we put a light bulb over the head. Mm -hmm. right? I get it now. And I, I like, you know, all the Greek, a lot of the Greek knowledge words are seeing words. I see, but that's a metaphor, right? You don't see knowledge. Something's happening in the mind, and we call it seeing. Uh, in German and Latin, it's all grabbing words. Like a, a, a concept is some, it's related to the word capture. In Hebrew, it's listening words. It's all I hear, you know. Um, but it's metaphorical. What did the boy do? Maybe it's not just metaphorical. It's kind of magical. I'm, I'm perpetually astounded that humans can go from the state of not knowing something to knowing it. And I don't know how it happens, mm -hmm. but it happens. I think part of what's going on here is although they don't arrive at a final conclusion, they have discovered the limitations of a lot of the things that they did believe. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. They know that the good life isn't necessarily sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? That could kind of be dead. So they make progress towards the truth and maybe right opinion. But it, in human life, can you ever get the absolute knowledge? I don't know. In geometry. On the persuasion side, uh, most advertisers don't believe in persuasion. Um. It's about changing someone's mind is awfully expensive or you'd have to sit with them it, it, like a therapist, right? And, hmm. and even then, I'd say, usually you can change someone's mind with a gun at them, but that's about it. Um, what you can do is align, show them how the behavior or whatever there is in line with what they want. Hmm. So we call it a theory of an alignment. Um, you can get cheese whiz people to put cheese whiz on hot dogs because it's junk food on junk food. You can't get cheese whiz on anything respectable. <laughs> <laughs> what anything respectable? I sometimes with clients with weightlifting clients, I have to do values clarification. <laughs> I can't change them, right? But I, right. I, I can try to say, no, this is what you really want. You know, you, you only think you want that, but what you really want is, is this. You really want that four but or five. The, you may be more on the knowledge side then in changing, I think. I think coaches, that's a, another thing we haven't talked about is, is Socrates as a coach. Yeah. Okay. So think about persuasion. Is it... Well, is Mino persuaded of anything? Does he change think. at all? I don't think so. If I were him, I'd be running back to Gorgias. Who's going to show me how to be successful. Right, give me That's not thing. a good idea. <laughs> Hold on. I, I did see something. Um, I have to find my note. Back to Thessaly. Well, he's not a skeptic anymore. No. There's at least that, right? When you get to the end of the geometry problem, he appears to think that perhaps we can actually know stuff. But he also thinks that Socrates is going to either end up dead or thrown out of anywhere he is. So if he's looking at, I don't think he's finding him an attractive role model. And he's also seeing him piss off. Antius. 
And yeah. Socrates begging, what are the last words? Is Socrates is sort of asking uh, Mino to calm Antius down. I don't know. You convinced your guest friend Anathus here. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah. That's how it ends. Like, I wonder if he did it. Yeah, because try to get these people who are pissed at me not to be so pissed. Well, apparently he wasn't successful. We know he wasn't successful, but did he try? Yeah, yeah I don't know. The one thing I'll add, this is not uh, necessarily Mino coming to new knowledge, uh, but it's at 82... 81E to 82A. So Socrates says, Why, Mino, I just said you were unscrupulous, and now you are asking me to teach you. When I claim there's no teaching but recollection, just so I can straight away prove myself inconsistent. No, no, Socrates, that was surely not my aim. I just spoke from habit. Right? Um, before, yeah. he really was not aware of his habits uh, but here he realizes that there's something ingrained now he's not fully on the path to philosophy but he is starting to think about why he speaks as he does we don't get to see what happens after but that's awareness right that's awareness that he would be deprived of especially since he's always surrounded by people who are telling him things that make him think ah, i don't have to worry about that right now he's he's thinking in the process of conversation especially in this trying to get him to move from heuristic to dialectic, that, you know what, this, this is an old heuristic habit. Um, I should speak differently. So there's that slight change. So this gets to what's the point of, you know, what we're doing. And, and we're not just reading Plato. We're reading all sorts of stuff. But, you know, what if somebody's – I think it's ultimately just because it's fun. That's the best reason. But – Yeah, it is. Thinking – in terms of, of use, well, there, there, there is out there a lot of non-thinking of identity politics, of reaction, of emotional reaction. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot of thinking. And I'm like I say, I'm being vague because I don't want to – there's good people who think all sorts of things. But so we get 10,000 people re going through the Mino. Well, there's 10,000 people who might say, is what that guy telling me really true? How can I know it's true? Let me examine that closer. Are they, you know, um, and uh, I think the, the Dorothy Sayers thing, I, I think I talked about that with Malachi, the, the lost tools of learning, where she says she worked in advertising, that one of the benefits from doing this kind of thing is just self-defense. Right. Everyone's trying to manipulate us. Yep. All of us. And being able to think through stuff and say, well, what is this really? Maybe you maybe you're just not as easy of a mark anymore. You know? Which is I, I think it's a, a big benefit. It's like the uh the Pete Townsend and the Who won't get fooled again. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Learning something does kind of feel like recollection, right? Like we, we, we rarely kind of ease into knowing something. You know, there's a, there's a moment and it's like, a you, like you broke a glass rod. It's just like click and then you got it. You know, there's a, there's a moment where you, it's, it's revelatory when you suddenly understand something and it becomes yours. We rarely, you know, I think that if you're somebody that can kind of iterate into knowledge and you like get closer and closer and closer and you know you're getting closer and you're like, man, it's right there. And then those people are f f rare and they're the ones that have all the huge breakthroughs that change the universe, you know. Uh, but, for the, for the, but for the rest of us, we, uh, we creep up on this stuff and then it snaps and we've got it. And then that's a light bulb thing. That's why it's that way in the cartoons. Reading the Mino and thinking about knowledge and thinking about learning is super important in terms of the self-defense thing because you can then look at, like, as a third person, right? You can almost, like, step away from your beliefs and look at those things and say, God, do I really know that? Was this something that was handed to me? Is this part of the, is this just, like, you know, baked into me from my potty training? Or is it actually something I really, really know 
like, where am I on this thing? Is this a knee jerk reaction or is this something that I know? And, um, you know, doing this work has, this is going to sound negative, but it's not, it's almost unmoored me. Right. Like I'm not, I'm not as ideal, ideological as I once was. And I don't, uh, I don't claim to know what I once thought I knew. I still hate the universe, but, uh, uh, but I, you know, I'm less definite about that. Well, I think one of the most important things about this is as we learn how to, uh, to pick a text apart, right? Mm. You ultimately then learn how to pick your own brain. Right. I think uh, one thing I did in, in advertising is I used to teach the writing course because people who went to Harvard and University of Chicago and had MBAs couldn't write a coherent summary of a meeting or a, a, a sales class. They couldn't write. And when I, when I was exploring with trying to figure out why they couldn't write, it, was, it wasn't grammar. You know, it's because they had nothing to say. Hmm. Because they really hadn't thought about anything. When they were suddenly asked to think about something, like summarize a meeting, they didn't think about, well, why am I summarizing? Who am I summarizing it for? And what are they going to be using this for? They never asked those questions of themselves. So they ended up writing a generic piece of crap that would be useless to you. So my point is, I think, what the, how this this program helps people grow is as you put together text and then with each other pick pick ideas you start to get the skills to pick your own brain to do what you're talking about scott which is well what do i really think here you know they say we're supposed to go to war with iran is that why do they think that's a good idea but that's all i'm saying is it 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 and, and socrates to me is the epitome of getting you to pick your own brain if you start asking yourself the questions he's asking or even a little more systematically the way Aristotle asked them, and you kind of end up with a trivium, you know, where you work your way through definitions, classifications, comparisons and contrast and benefits and whatnot, you end up with good ideas. Great ideas. Great <laughs> ideas. <I> mean, <laughs> great books. With great uh, books. <laughs> uh, I think one of the important things we have not even touched on at all, again, because these books are so thick, this is a little dialogue and is whether there's such a thing as a form, you know, what is it that we're trying to get to when, we're, what are we trying to know? If we're going to know what virtue is, is there, is it merely convention or is there actually a truth that we could get to? Not that we actually get to it, but do we have reason to think that there are such things? If we're going to, let's say, we establish our, our, our new republic and we're going to sit around and figure out what virtue is. So we get, you know, the five smartest people, which is us, and we sit around and what do you think virtue is? Well, is it this? Well, it's not that. Is it this? Well, it's not. How do we have any guarantee that our, our knocking off of false things is going to get us closer to an, the actual truth? Well, <clears throat> I don't know that we do, right? I mean, we, well, we can certainly say what's not. If um, we agree that those things are virtuous, then by definition, by mapping out the boundary around them, you have to then have defined virtue because those things are virtuous because we've said they're virtuous. That's but, how definitions but, work. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Descriptive, are, not is, prescriptive, is, right? <laughs> no, you can are things pious point. because the gods love them or do the gods love them because they're pious? Is it virtuous because we say it's virtuous or do we say it's virtuous because we've discovered an intrinsic quality that is actually virtuous? Okay, so even if we have discovered something, those things that we say are virtuous are representations of that discovery. Yes. I don't have any problem with that. Um, yeah, I mean, but lists uh, don't get you there, right? We could right. make it. We could make a list of all that. We could say Secretariat, Man of War, you know, I don't know. Seabiscuit. Seabiscuit, blah, 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 and have a giant list and still not know anything really about horses. Yeah, but it has to be the thing that links them together, right? Because no. lists don't have the, don't fill in the gaps. It's just dots 
on a graph. You don't have a line. Right. So in, in science, you actually make a representation of what you think the truth is in a theory and um, a mathematical representation of a, a relationship. Model. Yeah, a model. Um, and we, we, are, we, we use a metaphor. We call them laws of nature. Which is, you know, getting into philosophy of science, it gets kind of weird because law implies, well, I don't know. Um, but we think we're discovering something. Gravity, we think we're discovering something. Right. Like right? there's actually a thing there that we can describe. Well, is there actually a thing there for virtue that we can describe? Well, if we can, if mutual, if different people can reach the same conclusions from, uh, different starting points and not knowing the other person, then surely that thing must exist. Something is reachable from multiple directions from by multiple different people. Then right. So that works with calculus. So, so Leibniz and, and Newton both come up with the same thing. Yeah. Leibniz invents it and publishes it. And Newton says, Oh, I had that in the drawer. I did that a few years ago. <laughs> well, I forgot to publish it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, can you do something uh, this was this was part of the experience of the sophists in ancient Greece the sophists I mean that you, you go to the next town over and they have completely different rules do you have the case where different groups of people come up with the same thing well in regards to virtue yeah well okay so different towns have different view rules but do those different rules still describe a virtuous action like a virtuous person so even though they're different rules are both ways of acting virtuous so you have uh, genghis khan versus uh buddha right hmm. one's virtuous death match <laughs> Confucius is on the sideline saying, I'll be in. <laughs> Two men enter, one man leave. Well, virtuous in what way? <laughs> I guess I'm going to play Mino here. I mean, sure. uh, um, uh, Buddha is uh, a w w wonderful thinker leading you to lead a highly detached life. Mm -hmm. Is a detached life virtuous? I would say no, I'm not a Buddhist. Uh, I think an engaged life is more interesting. Uh, Genghis Khan represents a, you know, uh, principles of uh, uh, of nationhood and expansion and bringing order where there is no order. Might be uh, right. Yeah, um, doing what those guys do. It, it, he has certain virtues. So, so is you know, George is, uh, Patton. Virtuous. I don't know. Maybe what do generals do? So is virtue not an a priori thing that exists outside of human cognition? I think we're stuck. We're going to be stuck until we can bring in something of Aristotle. Uh, yeah, it's always Aristotle. Yeah, but it is. no, it's in the Republic. It's not all Aristotle. Aristotle's just stealing. <laughs> that was but, rather uncharitable, but I'll let it slide. <laughs> <laughs> inventing, but you, if no, you have to get inventing, stealing. You have to get into questions of nature. Okay, so in order to answer the question of is something virtuous, you have to say so. Virtuous. What's the? Uh, uh, and I, I. So if we're doing this on the podcast, I don't want you to think just because John and I have been throwing Greek words around, mostly him, that you have to. No Greek to do this. By the okay. way, what John says in my translation, he literally means the one that he translated. <laughs> the one in his <laughs> notebook. That good. Right. Yeah, I'm reading uh, you know, some derivative. So the word for, okay, so real, real briefly, the word for virtue is erite, okay? And it means something like excellence. So, it, and it's not necessarily a moral, a moral category. A knife has the virtue or excellence of sharpness because it helps it be what a good knife is. <laughs> knives are supposed to cut things. Except in England, Miles, but knives are supposed to cut England, things. England, man. No, no, you can't have sharp knife in England. No. Um, so your knives are not virtuous. Okay. Well, no, because they're not designed to cut. Right, so right. They're, they're more like, they're more like 
skinny bags. That that ornamental. We hang uh, them off the walls. We pretend we cook. So, so, so in, uh, it's really easy Greek, to figure out a virtue for a knife. So well, in Greek, do all virtues have like the teleology have the purpose b- baked in? Uh, it, I don't know all, but it, it's well, it's the way Aristotle uses it. You know, um, what's a human for? So virtue for a knife. Okay, virtue for a human. What is the proper characteristic activity of a human? Is there such a thing? Well, if we knew that, then we can answer the question of virtues. Rationation, right? Right. So if, if you think that's right, so um, let's say it's what we're doing right now. Reason. Dialectic. Okay. Now we can work out some things that are not virtuous, can't we? Like habitual drunkenness would not be good for what we're doing here. Unless you're Charles Bukowski. <laughs> Heroin use. Not good. Um, having a really, really bad temper. Right? I'm so mad at you guys. Yeah, and I slammed the laptop shut. That wouldn't work either. So virtue questions are unsolvable, in my opinion, until you, you, you try to figure out virtue for what and then figure out the what. What is a human being? And what's a good example of a human being? And that's a tricky question, but I don't know that it's unsolvable. Uh, he attacks it with the four causes, right? So you've got to know the purpose, the, the yeah. form. Yeah. It, yeah. We are, what our material limitations are and our material. But what yeah. I like about Aristotle, he'll put a stake in the ground and say it's, you've got to think it through with these four things. Yeah. He's not afraid to make a commitment, which Socrates doesn't generally make. Right. Um, Aristotle will, he'll, he'll take a stand. Uh, We don't like nowadays to talk about nature, which makes these things problematic, right? What's a, what's a human? Well, it's whatever you want it to be. Well, if that's your answer, then you can't come up with virtues. You know, if I am whatever I, if I declare myself a unicorn, then you have to think I'm a unicorn. I can't, you know. An attack helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, that's the tricky question. Is there, that's the question in the background. It's one that is going to be dealt with in the Republic. What is the nature of a human being? So there's all sorts of stuff about nature in the Republic. There's not so much here. There's just a some mention of it. Does it mean that does virtue come from nature? Well, I don't know. What's the nature of a human? I'm Have thinking of uh, the, the last British edition of the Britannica. Right? I think it was the 9th to the 11th. And it was written around in the early 1900s in the Edwardian period. Hmm. And the articles are fascinating. If you look up dog or horse, it would be that article would be written by a, a keeper of the hounds for His Majesty King Edward. Okay, so instead of this kind of pap you would get in the Britannica today, scientific descriptions of various dogs and breeding, you would get the keeper of the hounds talking about what each dog is good for. You know, this one's the best for rabbits. This one's the best for hunting duck and structure. Same with wine. Greatest article on whiskey in the world is on the ninth edition comparing Scotch, Irish, and American whiskeys. But to that point, he takes, there's a sense of responsibility beyond just being descriptive and scientific of feeling an obligation to put a value on things as well, and relative to their importance. So to, to talk to that keeper of the hounds of just giving a mere objective rational description would be insufficient for human life and lacking in insight. And I think that's also Plato's insight. It's not a reason's important, but reason has to take you to, to the hierarchy of goods, I think. 
Yeah, I think so. And so the, the way that Socrates presents a model of action becomes really important, right? So any sort of argument about value, how do you argue about value? You know, um, you can't really. So you can say, uh, you can say, I'm going to pick on Miles because he's young, but I'm sure because he's young, he listens to crap music by definition. Can verify. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, just, that's intentional just to piss you off. Uh, I don't like any of that. Mission accomplished. So I, let's let's say I want to introduce him to Chet Baker. And I can argue that he ought to like Chet Baker. Because it's conformable to your nature. But in the end, I got to show him. <clears throat> He'll either get it and we'll still be friends, or he won't, and he's out in the dark. Uh, and you may have to take him on a path to get there. It may not just right. be exposing him to Chet Baker, but other artists and understanding what they were after first with a guitar and what a guitar is and what it's for. Well, yeah, Baker's a trumpet player, but yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'm thinking of Chet Atkins. It was we love Chet. Him too. Same thing. We like Chet Atkins, too. <laughs> Uh, all good-hearted people like Chet Atkins, uh, by definition. Just but so, in general. Any Chet, yeah. Uh, any. <laughs> but so that's a, it, it's an it's a it's an artistic project. Let me paint you this picture of what it would be like if you were this sort of man, and then you fall in love with it, which is why. So if I can get you to love something, I can get you to do it. And I, I think there's a lot of that. There's some of it in here. There's definitely in the Republic, but it's, it's a project of revealing a beautiful thing. So all of those uses of the word for beauty, you know, isn't this a beautiful way to live? Not that you're theatrical way with Gorgias, but this way, you know, that, that this is the best way. Um, yeah, values, arguing for values is, is uh, it's so much like art that some people think it's just entirely garbage. You know, it's all a Jackson Pollock painting. But it relies on the instinctual, right? You have to instinctually fall in love with something. That's not a rational decision. And therefore, it's something that I guess is more innate to the human animal than rationality. It's like, within you to fall in love with this. Yeah, and it's prior to rationality. I yeah. would call it irrational. Or isn't it also, Carl, I thought you had a, a big insight there. If you connect it to habit, like I imagine when you guys are training people at first, it's very, am I sure I want to sign up for this? This is like really hard. Mm -hmm. But a year later, if they stuck with it, it becomes it ranks from number 25 in their life to the top five things they do. Mm. Or they would can't dream of starting their morning without their right. Not that it's still that it ever gets easy, but they are so many runners love running. You know, if I even ran in the morning, I I don't feel myself. People will say so. I think you do grow. You know, you can grow to love something that at first you don't like. I mean, think how many romantic movies are based upon uh, yeah. the, the two people who don't get along but are forced together. Arrangement. And then end up being in love. That's one third of the romance novels, uh, Hallmark movies. <laughs> yeah. But I, so, I, go ahead. I was gonna say I wouldn't say it's um, I wouldn't say it's entirely irrational. I wouldn't say it's all habit. I, but I think Maliki's right. Right. Sometimes you do have to get accustomed to these things, like reading the great books. Um, you have to get accustomed to reading them in order to appreciate it. Uh, but it would be odd to say that love is just kind of emotional or, or completely, I think there's an intuitive element to it, but there has to be, I think in love, and I think this is what Socrates is getting at, right? Do people choose bad things thinking they're bad or do they choose them thinking it's good? There has to be something that clicks that indicates to you that this is good for you. I love right? um, John Pascarella. He always brings it back to the text, you know? I, it's a, it's a habit that uh, it's it's hard to kick. It's a good habit. But I, I think there is that something in you has to recognize that this is indeed good for me. And, and it gets to those questions of worth, right? Um, is it just conventional? Is it just because we say this thing is valued or 
or does nature actually reveal some things are more valued than others, right? And one way to look at this, what can you do longer, right? Can you eat longer than you can think? For some people, maybe they can, right? But there's a limit to eating that thinking doesn't quite have that limit, right? So that there are these clues along the way that there's something more enduring that we can see its worth is there. But how you habituate yourself to it, how you accept it, that's a much more subjective thing, right? Not everybody's going to be attracted to the same thing in the same way. Yeah. Yeah. So there's these pictures that are drawn. Uh, well, Socrates himself is such a picture, but he also draws them of, of what a wise man, not that he claims wisdom, but what a wise man would be, what a, you know, he himself is an example to, to reveal kind of a higher level of of existing does that make sense there's that scene in book seven of i think it's book seven of the republic where uh glaucon finally has i think been converted to philosophy and he says oh what beautiful men these are that you've drawn for me you know he, he's uh he wants to be like the philosopher kings and i i think that's a key moment that um he wouldn't be drawn if his nature wasn't let, – let's look, come back to what John said. He wouldn't be drawn to them if there wasn't something in his nature that was attracted to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. The beauty is – I say this in a big fight against the entire 20th century art. Beauty is not something subjective. It's, it's something that appeals to you. I would say to your nature and that draws you on. Um, and so it can be revelatory. We will do, Let me another, add, we will um, do another show about uh, Carl's aesthetics. <laughs> do you mind if I, I add like a couple them. things to Carl's aesthetics? Yes. So I'll do, I'll go, I'll go back to the text for this because there are a couple ways to do this, uh, but I'll do it with the text first. So if you look at the end of the dialogue, uh, so this is 99 B to C. Right, so it's the issue of um, true opinion guiding people. Right. And so Socrates says, right before C, then if not by knowledge, only true opinion is left. That is what men in political life used to direct their cities rightly, differing in no way from soothsayers and seers in respect to understanding. For the latter also say many things which are true and understand nothing of what they're saying. Very likely. Right. Now, Mino, isn't it proper or worthy to call men divine when without possessing intellect, they bring a multitude of important things to successful issue in what they do and say? Right. Um, so here is kind of right, the issue where you could say intelligence, right? This revelation is just purely out of your hands that you, you can't know it. Right? But Socrates doesn't seem to be taking that seriously, right? There's a way to think about what's divine and what is natural in relation to the intellect, right? That people, people know these things, uh, and it's, not, it's just not nonsense. It doesn't come out of nowhere, right? That's, that's one way you could look at it. It's like, well, we can't know anything unless uh, we're tapped into it from the gods. But at the end, I think Socrates presents this choice that maybe, right, he leaves open the possibility that the intellect and divine aren't necessarily this thing where uh, there's no agency, on the part of yourself, right? That's completely open. That's not in this dialogue as much, but he leaves that hanging, right? Um, that there is a way to think about the divine that might be more intelligent than just saying, well, and then Zeus gave this to me. Um, I just think it's interesting he leaves that open at the end uh, and doesn't quite do as much with it there, but you'll see this in the Republic where Socrates talks about, well, what's divine in us? Um, and so that's just kind of a, an interesting thing to be. And then, if it helps, you can tell people who can't answer for where they get their political principles that they're soothsayers, uh, and you can let, <laughs> let me know how that goes over. <laughs> John, can I explore that with you a little bit? Thinking a, a bit about Aristotle's politics. So, so there's a guy who's pushed up to a major office you, because of relationships with people. He's often either won it through power or other powerful people support him, right? But somehow he's put, uh, and and he may, and he doesn't know where his principles came from. 
He just knows that he kind of stands for these things and these things have worked for him with it, with his instincts, right? But he's sort of pushed up to prominence. So what is, is what's at work here more of what Aristotle would call the wisdom of the crowd? And is that really, does that bring down the divine inspiration a little more practically? In other words, it's the spirit of the age. Certain people are converged upon because they seem to, they're the pretty girl in geometry class that everybody converges at. Um, but for some reason, uh, I, I tried you to converge on some people <laughs> as representing the aspirations and imagine futures. Am I making any sense here? Yeah, that's back to uh, Hambrick's theory of aesthetics, right? <laughs> you know, these, these well, these things uh, embody some sort of, uh, well, virtues that we laud, proportion, symmetry, et cetera. And so this person embodies, you know, Churchill, you know, maybe embodied, mm-hmm. embodied set of ideals that, that people wanted the nation to embody at that time. And so they converged on him. Right. Um, and I think my aesthetics kind of goes along with that, but I don't know if that's uh, where you were headed with that, but I, I get it. But their convergence versus divine inspiration. I'd be, I've, I haven't made up my mind on it. I'm interested in hearing what other people think. I don't think, I don't think Aristotle treats politics like it's divine inspiration. Um, now, he is right, right? Some people do get elevated in political life, but I think both Plato and Aristotle would say, well, let's figure out why they were elevated, right? So we can see that if it's, if it's, if you have an oligarchy, for example, wealthy people are just going to pick wealthy people. That's what they like, right? Democrats are going to pick poorer people. Um, and you know, the aristocratic lines, they'll pick somebody from a certain family. So you can see why somebody elevates. But then Plato and Aristotle also argue you can step back and think about why was that person elevated? Um, And you see a little bit of this in the way it plays out within the Mino, that constantly both Mino and Socrates praise people for being wise. But when Socrates introduces wisdom, uh, he says it about a man who was known to be wise because he made a lot of money. Now, it doesn't seem that's what wisdom is really about. And Aristotle has that funny joke in the politics. Thales showed that philosophers could make money if they wanted to, but that's not what they're thinking about. Um, that behind political life, behind the things people value, is some loose awareness of something that transcends conventional worth. Right. So to the extent that people value wisdom, they might disagree about what it is, right? Same thing, virtue. They uh, agree that virtue is something honored, but they disagree about what virtue is. There's something there, right? So it's not just divine for Aristotle. It's not just conventional. We can, if we step back, look at what people are saying, we can make a move towards that natural underpinning and foundation of politics. And then we can decide how well each particular regime relates to that standard. Good ideas. Thank you. Welcome. Very insightful. Well, that was a seminar discussing Plato's dialogue, The Mino. I hope you guys liked it. We had so much fun doing it that we resolved to do this on a regular basis just for our own gratification, you know, as folks that um, do the seminars. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please go to iTunes, give us those reviews, like I said. And if you've got any questions about what we do, how we do it, the show, comments, feedback, please go to support at onlinegreatbooks.com and email us, and I'll help you in any way I can. Thanks so much for listening.